This week, reverse analyzing attacks for detection with Justin Henderson from SANS. There's a lot of SANS on the previous show and this show. Eric Conrad from SANS joins us as a special guest in studio. In the security news this week, Microsoft should just STFU. Auditing is not fuzzing. Ghost hooking. No Honda for you today. The not-so-average cost of a breach. Chromebook security features. The RNC files. And Girl Scouts. All that and more on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security certification training and research. Visit SANS.org to explore their full curriculum and latest training offerings. Gain control of cyber risk with Tenable IO, the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud, containers, and web apps. Discover a fresh, asset-based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment. And improve ROI with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets, not IP addresses. Tenable IO delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface. Start your free Tenable IO trial today by visiting tenable.io. Onapsis is the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce to you my good friend, confidant, compatriot, Steve Jobs. No, I'm Paul Asador. Welcome, everyone, <laughs> to Paul Security <laughs> Weekly. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian. Very, very happy to be here. Is that what I'm that e- smell is? I'm excited about the whole the whole show, Larry. Uh, Larry's here in studio. Welcome, Larry. Yay! Very nice. Mr. Eric Conrad is in studio. Eric, welcome to our <laughs> wonderful studio. Thanks for having me. My office was actually cleaning because I got a, a new desk yesterday, okay. so... Eric got to see the one time this year. I did. Clean. As far as <laughs> I know, it's always like that. It's awesome. <laughs> That's right. Um, let's see. On the lines via Skype, Mr. Jeff Mann is here. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, everybody. Good to see y'all. Good to see you, Jeff. <laughs> Mr. Joff Fire, certified SANS instructor. Yes. Mr. Joff Fire is here with us. Woo-hoo. Speech. Woo-hoo. Speech. Oh, speech. Oh speech. 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 G- g- g'day. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, stole my thunder. But yes, certified SANS instructor as of today. Very happy to be at the other end of that process. You're certifiably an instructor in a number of other things as well. Yeah, that's just true. <laughs> <laughs> Quick announcement before we get into it. Um, okay, so we're doing the Eric interview first. Then we're doing a technical segment. I read them in reverse order. Quick announcement, ITEpro.tv's courses now include Computer Hacking, Forensic Investigator V9, Kali Linux, CompTIA A+, 901, and Accelerated CompTIA Security+. Plus. Premium annual memberships include all video content, as well as access to virtual labs and Q&A forums. Get 30% off monthly memberships for the lifetime of your active subscription using the code SW30. Now, I would like to introduce... The one and the only Eric Conrad, who began his career in 1991 as a Unix systems administrator for a small oceanographic, oceano, ocean, is that right? oceanographic, 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 sure. oceanographic communications company. He gained information security experience in a variety of industries, including research, education, power, internet, and healthcare. 
He is now the CTO of Backshore Communications, a company focused on hunt teaming, intrusion detection, incident handling, and penetration testing. He is a graduate of SANS Technology Institute with a Master's of Science degree in Information Security Engineering. In addition to a CSSP, we won't hold that against him, yep. he holds the prestigious <laughs> GIAC Security Expert GSE certification, which in Security Week of History, we've had uh, two shows in a row. We've had a GX certified security expert, a GX security expert on the show. Two tonight, Justin Henderson. Two He's tonight. Two tonight. That's a, a triple up. header. Doubling up. What's going on, Eric? Mm-hmm. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. What, what are we talking about today? I don't uh, know. They just said Eric's coming now. I'm like, sure. All right, cool. sure. Um, well, I was told half of it's going to be uh, cyber defense net wars and building challenges, uh, making um, blue team challenges sexy. And the other half was how to be a SANS instructor very timely, given the job was uh, promoted to SANS certified instructor yes. today. So uh, I'd like to think I had some small part in that because you know, Conrad's talking about Joff. So uh, being a SANS certified instructor, we better promote the guy. It's embarrassing if we don't. So That's I'm right. going to take some credit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I did nothing. But, I just <laughs> so, uh, but claim, claim credit for it. Well, I yeah. did. I did. Good, good. Thank you. <laughs> so let's talk about cyber defense uh, exercises sure. um, for blue teams yes. specifically. Yep. Do a lot of enterprises partake in, in such things? Well, they're fairly new. Um, you know, we've been looking at these NetWars challenges. You know, we saw a bunch of challenges built. I saw Jim Shoemaker, Shoemaker do some cool stuff years ago. Of course, Ed Scotus and his, you know, band of ninja elves at CounterHack have done amazing stuff. But all the, all the, it seems like almost all the CTFs were either pen testing or forensics, pen testing forensics, and they get all the cool, sexy stuff. And the blue team, which is the vast majority of InfoSec, got none of that cool stuff. We didn't have coins. We didn't have those challenges. <laughs> and uh, what ended up happening is a lot of blue team, um, you know, folks play red team challenges and hey that's fun too but as we've been saying for years now to sans we're bringing the sexy back to blue team why don't we have there's no reason technically why we don't have this stuff the vast majority of infosec people are blue teamers so let's build some stuff so we built a number of blue team challenges initially for security 511 which is seth mises i know he's been on the show myself's class and um, now, is, is this uh, part of Ed Scotus's initiatives as well, or is it separate? Uh, well, from it, Ed? It, it's separate. Well, I mean, our curriculum, the, the blue team curric- curriculum of SANS, is separate from Ed's, but we're using NetWars for these challenges. Of course, Net- Ed built NetWars. And um, so NetWars is basically a scoring engine, a framework around capture the flag say, challenges. So NetWars is the framework. NetWars is the fr- it's just a scoring engine, and and so we built the initial ones for Security 511, which is continuous monitoring. A class Seth and I wrote, and then all the you know at Sands you have these these two night challenges with you know three hours of challenges each night, and then playing music and, and there's food, there's beverages, and a big you know room of 300 people. Like we want that for Blue Team, we want that for Blue yeah. Team. So we built Cyber Defense NetWars. It launched Stealth Mode in Orlando. This this year, we ran it in SecWest. It runs next at Sands Fire in uh, June, I believe, or July. It, it, coming up, time's a blur. And uh, it's been awesome. We had 50 people in the room. Really, we had about 70 people in the room. Most capped at 50 in San Diego at SecWest. But we had 20 extra people show up. We're like, sure, come on in. And uh, it's been awesome. So what, what kind of things do they encounter Sure. So, Cyber Defense Net Wars, the, um, the metaphor, the story is you're a defender on the wall. This is a Game of Thrones theme. Uh-huh. You're recruiting the Night's Watch. You're defending the wall. And you're defending the wall. Initially, level one is just you're securing the wall, the firewalls, things like that. Level two, the humans attack the wildlings. Level three, the undead attack the whites. And level four, you have to catch the dreaded Night King, who's the king of all of that. And no one's actually found the Night King yet. The, the Night King has to be, be been hunted down, be hunted down. And of all the times we ran it, and all the testers who went through it, we're talking about GSEs, but a bunch of GSEs tested before we went live. No students found it, and only one tester found the Night King. And that was Justin Henderson, who follows me in about an hour now. Uh, he found the Night King. He's the only one so far. Wow. So, it, so Justin, no spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers. Have, Spoiler alert. <laughs> so are there attackers and defenders when they come in, or it, are they only defenders? And like, who it's plays? defenders. The attacks have already happened. So you've got a bunch of Windows event logs. You get PCAPs. You get log uh, files. And you're hunting okay. through that for signs of attack. <laughs> Uh, initially, level one, we built it, you know, Ed has said this before, I think he said it on the show, Ed Scotus, you know, it's easy to build a really easy challenge, it's easy to build a really hard challenge, yes. but the middle where someone like a, a, th- a 301 or a 401 student, 301 being kind of the on-ramp in the sands, 401 being security essentials broad, and we want those people to have a ton of fun, but we want someone who lives in a sock and does command, you know, either PowerShell or Python yeah. all day long, we want them to be challenged too. And so building and having that middle ground it's really is it's tough. It's yeah. challenging. And say so it's Windows event logs, PCAPs, log files, there's Stego, there's crypto, there's general security stuff. 
And we had a bunch of 401 students take it who loved it, and a bunch of very advanced students. Again, only one student figured the whole game out, and that was Justin Henderson, and he's a ninja. That's awesome. Yeah. So do they, what do they get, like a VM? They get a yeah, they get a VM. There's a scoring engine. We get a, I basically stood up a Windows Active Directory domain for a few weeks in my office. I registered nightfort.org. Uh, if you know the story, one of the other castles on the wall. Castle Black is featured in the story, the HBO series and the books. I read the books originally. And you're defending um, the Night Fort, which is actually the largest and one of the oldest castles on the wall. And there's a domain, nightfort.org. There's a bunch of, you know, um, uh, there's uh, Telnet attacks, Telnet honeypot, there's SSH attacks, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And, and we give them just mountains of data, gigabytes and gigabytes, full packet capture is running for weeks, and they're going to sort through all that stuff. Just so like they you get would a, a Linux VM. A Linux VM based on a bunch of Windows logs. And a bunch of Windows capture. logs, exactly. And they're going to sift through full packet capture. And it's interesting to see students struggle with that. One of the comments we get in San Diego was, you should chop these PCAP files down smaller because I can't handle this. Well, guess what? Security Onion captures 150 megs at a shot. And when you hit 150 megs and a full packet capture, it rolls to the next one. And that's what you're getting. And you need to figure that out. You know, this is real stuff. Yeah, this it's, is stuff that you would be using yeah, in your environment. Exactly. This is actual live data. Now, it's play data. You know, it was in my office. But we active directory domain. And you know if you run full packet capture on a live network, that thing's going 24-7 with just nothing and noise and Windows systems and that bias. It's just constant stuff in a network. And then once in a while, the attack rolls in. They're going to hunt that thing down and find it. Yeah, certainly they could carve up the PCAP file themselves. They um, could, so but... That's what but, you're encouraging. Exactly, but they yeah. struggle, just like we all struggle. That's what we all yeah. do. You start diving into real data. Real data is strange. There's tons of it. It's 99.99% .99 just benign noise, and that's that point, you know, one or 001% of the signal. And you see students struggling with that, but that's the real struggle we all face in, at our jobs, you know, if you're defending. Right. Um, what are some strategies for hunt teaming in this uh, particular scenario, Eric? So we, we give broad um, guidance, like we, it's characters from the show, and, and one of the scenarios is a uh, ransomware scenario. And you know, I lit up real ransomware in my lab, and I had to just you know encrypt all the things and do all the stuff ransomware does, and it's phoning home to some weird DGA domain ge generated uh, algorithm, domain generation algorithm domains. And I'll say, oh, Benjamin Stark did it again. He clicked on an email at at thirteen thirteen on February twelfth. Go, and then answer these oh, questions. So they get like uh, some general direction. For, yeah. for the night, for the night, night king, they get nothing. For the night king, find the night king. That's all they get. That's all they get. I got <laughs> and it, and it's, it's somewhere in the data you've been looking at for the past six hours. Somewhere in that, you know, all the gigabytes of data is the night king. But initially, yeah, at thirteen thirteen, Benjamin Star clicked on an email, and he said, "Oh, he got a weird pop up. Go." And they they chase it down. Just like right. if I, someone called the help desk and say, "Hey, my PC slowed down. I got blue screen, mm -hmm. or my desktop got crypto locked. Whatever." You'd start from there hunting, you know? So we, we call those injects, right? Sure. Um, and that's, that's great. That it, and I recommend when people do that, because um, sometimes people say, well, how do I do some kind of like exercise, even if it's an incident response tabletop exercise? Right, sure. And when you explain them the concept of uh, injects, they're like, oh, sure. wow. Like that's really, I think, what ties everything together right. and gives the students a path and purpose and looking for the next, like, what's Eric going to tell us to, to go find that? What's the next clue, you know? Sure. Sure. The other thing we have is we have hints. So level one and two have uh, full hints, meaning that the, the second hint is, the third hint is how to get the answer. Uh, not the answer itself, but the commands to type to get the answer. Level three is one hint, which is a nudge, and level four, the Night King's got nothing. And what you see is students, and, and the hints are free, but serve as a tiebreaker, because in the end, you know, we hand out 10 coins, Cyber Defense Net Wars coins, which in my opinion and others, is the best looking coin in all of Sands. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I don't know about the best, but they're pretty darn sexy looking. It's a sexy coin. Yeah. And we hand out 10 coins in the end, five for the individual winners and five for the, the team winners. And, um, and so levels one, two, full hints, and hints are free, because we want students to walk away knowing more than they walked in. It's easy as a newbie to walk into a challenge get, and get very little and get frustrated to walk away. We want them having a good time and walking away knowing more about hunting and blue teaming than they walked in with. So level one's to, and f to a full hints. Hints are free except they serve as a tiebreaker. You know, if Larry took 10 hints and someone next to him took 20, uh, Larry would win if they had a tie score. Level three is one hint and level four, no hints. And what you see is the 301, 401 style students end up using up all the hints. Right. And there's a hint strategy too because there's a time element too. I mean, the only time a hint uh. matters is if you tie. And time, you get six hours basically. So I'd be hinting, knowing what, even what I know, I'd be hinting because what are the odds if you score pretty high, you'll be tied. We've never had a tie decide a game yet. So as a game kind of theory strategy thing, mm -hmm. I'd be taking hints because that would save you time on level three, four when the whole thing's going to slow down. And you get no hints at level four. Right? Nothing at level four. Yep, you're on your own. That's awesome. I, I, I have one one comment though. 
the um, automating info uh, automating infosec with Python challenge coin is much sexier. <laughs> oh my god! You're set up your well, job, we'll even now, though you're wrong. Yeah, now, see if fine. I had either one of those, I could give a you know a good analysis of both, but I don't have either. So you guys will have to work on that. <laughs> Consider it done. Yeah. See what I did there? Yeah, yeah. You did, I did. It worked too. I was just social engineer right there, live, live demo. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so when, when is this running next? In it's running at Sansfire, and I'm a bad Sans instructor because most of us live one day at a time, and I know what's happening tomorrow, and maybe a little bit next week, that's it. So Sansfire, which is um, in July, and, I yep, think. End of July. End of July. It, over, it overlaps with DEF CON. Overlaps, yeah, very conveniently overlaps with DEF CON, <laughs> but we're, we're, they capped it at 100. There's already, I think, 60 registered. So if you're watching this, you're going to be there, and this sounds good, sign up. Although uh, we tend not to turn people away, but don't tell Sans I said that. Tell who nice. said what. Exactly. As long as the check clears. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes if it doesn't. <laughs> That's it. So um, <clears throat> which, which tools and techniques do you recommend people be familiar with before going into this challenge? Sure. Um, you need to be able to handle one of those event logs, which tends to be actually the weakest part, because a lot of folks right. are kind of stands. They're the pen tester types. Even a lot of the defenders, they're... Um, heavy Linux, they know yeah, bash Yeah, they're not Windows admins. They're I've, not Windows admins, exactly. I haven't been a Windows admin since, like, Windows NT4. <laughs> and, and the Windows admins that come in tend to want to use Event Viewer to look at the event logs, which is a terrible way to look at event logs. My favorite way of looking at event logs is PowerShell. And uh, PowerShell, um, well, I actually like Python, too, but you've got to port them over there first. Um, but PowerShell is a wonderful, you know, way to look at event logs, get win events. And uh, I, I wrote a tool actually called Deep Blue CLI, which I talked about at DerbyCon last year, which is a PowerShell framework for finding this stuff. So I would actually use that free mm -hmm. hint for the Paul Security Weekly folks. Bring uh, Deep Blue CLI with you because it'll, it'll solve a bunch of this stuff. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, so PowerShell, um, so Windows, we have Windows admins, but Windows admins handy with PowerShell down to using get win event, carving up, because ultimately the event logs are XML and using get wind event to slice through them. Very few natively off the street know that. Once in a while we have someone. And beyond that, of course, packets. Um, so any kind of PCAP tool, whether it's Wireshark, right. T-Speed up, even down to strings. I, I, with a giant 150 meg yeah. PCAP, I'll start with strings, just look right. for something. You know, if I know the name of a site, you know, we have a site called uh, whites.us that, that is featured in the game, you know, uh, w-i-g-h-t-s.us. I would just run strings and, and grep, at least find out what file that thing's in. Okay, and it's on January 3rd, it's in that one. Yeah. It's uh, amazing how the old yeah. school Linux tools yeah. are still, work. to this day, so yeah. fast. Uh, I, like, uh, they very scale. fast. I, I, I make the joke when I teach the, the wireless class that I use the, my, my three favorite Uber Elite hacking tools include VI, strings, and Excel. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And uh, hey, hey, Emacs, Larry. Uh, if you'd said Emacs, oh, don't start. Don't start. <laughs> well, you could, you, could, you could use <laughs> VI all you day could long. Use said in a, in a so, so Joff, Mr. Recently Certified Sand exactly. Instructor, uh, it is no longer going to be uh, Python for pen testing. It's going to be Perl for pen testing. Have fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm out. <laughs> what was I looking at the other day? Was it Nikto? Nikto is still written in Perl. Yeah, I believe it. And it was updated like. The GitHub repo, the Git repo was updated Lies. like a couple months ago. Lies. They wrote it from scratch again. It didn't get updated. Look, they wrote it from Perl scratch Perl again in Perl. Like, right, right, apparently. Because you can't, you can't read Perl. Yeah. It does the exact same <laughs> thing. It's just the code's completely different. Yeah. Look, look, no, no Perl, Perl is like IRC. You can tear it from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> yes. I'm an old Perl guy. If you're slicing up text, Perl's the way. But if you're doing socket stuff, it's going to be Python. That's some sound advice. Fair yeah. enough. And Wait, beyond so that, I'm sorry, command line stuff because they got these giant log files, you know, Apache log files, so usual grep and stuff like that to carve to that stuff. I can grep for four or fours with the best of them. There you go. Inside. Well, you're in. You'll get at least, least, at least 100 points. You get to level two, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Yay, leveled up. If you take hints. <laughs> if you take hints. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Uh, yep. yep. And, and, it's, and it's surprising how many problems those simple tools like that can solve. Yeah. It's amazing. The first time I ever went and did Red Net Wars Ed side, um, there were a bunch of questions I had no idea how to answer. Like, right. Check this Firefox database yep. for this item. I'm like um strings. I don't well yeah. I don't I don't know how to use SQLite three, but I know how to use strings. Right. And sure enough. Yeah, I was looking at uh, the new 503 challenge. Judy Novak and Dave Holzer built a new Net Wars fuel challenge for day six of 503, which is the packet analysis class. And uh, they asked me to look at it uh, before it launched. So I got to play a Net Wars that I didn't build with fresh set of eyes and go through it. Actually, a blue team Net Wars, which oh. I've, never, I've never played a blue team challenge that I didn't actually build myself. 
And, and one of the challenges, I don't want to spoil it, but you know, they're, they're hiding messages. It's like Stego and DNS kind of a thing. Lots of ways to do that. But I, what I did was I ran TCP dump. And I'm running TCP dump. And I figure if, if it's like a message encoded in, TC, in, in one per packet in like the, you know, the evil bit or something, you know, some field on the offset for, the, uh, for a fragmentation is like a D and an A or something. So I ran TCP dump. And I see these letters coming down. And then I looked at the offset. Oh, that's at zero, 0 times 0, 0120. And I grep for that. You know, so I literally TCP dumped a screen text. And then I grep for the, the offset. With that, and, and, and there is the text right down the line, which I'm sure they didn't de design the challenge that way. But that was the fastest way for me to get to that yeah, answer. You know? Yeah. There's, there's, I, there's, I, there's I learned how to use TCP dump from Judy. So <laughs> they, yeah, she, she knows more about packets than anyone else on this planet. Yeah, yeah so pretty much. there is more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah, as, mm -hmm. the, as the saying goes. And it's not style points; it's really speed. Whatever gets you there the fastest. So yeah, it's, it's, it's well, and that's what it's like in the real world. Exactly, because right? it's a race against time, whether it's a pen test or whatever. When exactly. your managers or whoever are demanding results, right? Or when there's been an incident, we want to know what happened. Right. We need to root cause, to then. fix it. As long as right. you're not violating any laws, you, however you derive the answer, is right. fine. Right. right. As long as you don't have someone like locked in your basement or something, you can't <laughs> and then even then, out of them. and then even then. <laughs> <laughs> what is one thing that one of the students uh, or players in the game has done that like totally surprised you that you never would have thought of in the game that you can describe without giving anything away? I've just seen people. It's funny how you approach, you know, challenges. I, I, I saw one. It wasn't in this challenge. It was in a different challenge, but. Someone opened up a like 100, 100 meg PCAP and with Wireshark and went frame one, frame two, frame three. <laughs> wow. I had to go like, listen. <laughs> you might want to automate this. Yeah, and, and one of the things what's nice about the VM we built, we stole this idea from John Strand, is uh, he built a wiki in his offensive countermeasures class. And so his labs are in wiki format. And so when you have a lab come up, instead of a paper book, you can actually pull up this wiki and it shows, you can actually copy paste syntax. Oh, there. Yep. There's a walkthrough at the end saying type this command, type that command, type that that command, and if it's in a book, you're typing this, in our case, PowerShell command that's, you know, you know it wraps twice across the line, yep. and I'm like, it, a wiki... All it takes is one... Yep. Yeah. One typo. You're gonna mess it up. One at least typo. Twice. Exactly. And a lot people don't realize, you know, tab complete works in PowerShell, but of course it works differently than Bash because it ignores ambiguity. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll, it'll tab out past the point of being ambiguous. Uh, and unlike Bash, PowerShell, you can actually tab out most options to uh, to, to these um, commands. And so we'll point them at the wiki. And so we we stole that idea from John. We're like, John, we love this idea. Can we steal it? Do you mind? He said, Sure. So we put the wiki in 5.11, the um, t um, uh, continuous monitoring class. And when Cyber Defense Network is dropped, the, the VM already had the wiki in it. So how to use uh, TCP dump, how to use PowerShell, how to pull Windows event logs via PowerShell, all that stuff's in the wiki. And they can literally just start copying and pasting. That's awesome. And so, so mm. newbie students who come in, we want them to walk away being excited about Blue mm. Team and being successful, you know, getting some stuff done, you know, learning some stuff that maybe they can take back to work. Or, and, and so it, well, sometimes they need that nudge because not many classes have that. John's did and ours did, and that was it initially. And um, we give them that nudge, we'll show them that, and and then they get pretty self-sufficient, and with the hints, they're off and running. You know, you know what I found uh, along those lines, which I think is fantastic, is um, the <coughs> folks that work for me, I teach them all Linux. At least yep. I try. We're going to actually set up some more formal training sure. because you need, you need to know Linux to work here, basically. Sure, of course, of course. A lot of the infrastructure is built on Linux, um, and they need that for their job. Not only that, the stuff they're doing, while it may be audiovisual work, I've certainly said, well, I just like run this Linux command to right. like get those MP3s right. merged. Like right. you can just do that in one. Com like oh, I bring it into an edit. I'm like no, 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 no. Like just run. Oh wow. Right. You're well, like what people, what a lot of people don't realize that haven't benefited from <clears throat> largely those of us here on the show hosting the show, 15 plus years of experience using Linux and sure, Unix sure. or more. Right. Um, that the syntax that you were referring to. Like how specific that is, and yeah. I feel like I was telling someone else, like yeah. I feel like those that were really good at Windows applications, and you've got other talents of using software and general skills. If you don't have specific experience with Linux, you don't have that concept of how everything in your command matters. Yeah, yeah. spaces, single yeah. quotes, double quotes. So, so what I did, capital I drew an exercise. capitalization. Yeah, yeah. It, I think it's still on the board in there. You it is. Go look. Yeah. <laughs> so I drew like 15 different ways yeah. in which you could execute a command right. and get the same result. Sure. And I told them some of these commands don't have the same result, but most of them do. Right. And you got to tell me which ones sure. are which. And even though a lot of them haven't completed the challenge yet, what they got from it just approaching the challenge is 
oh, that's because it's a single quote, not, right. not a double cool. quote. Right. And so now they're, they're cognizant of it, and they're working on the details of some of the How do you, how do you write you know, smart you know, quotes on a whiteboard? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fuckers. You know, you know Paul, Paul, I got, I got yeah. to make a comment on that. When you when you start porting the, that knowledge over to Windows, where it breaks, especially in the PowerShell world, is anybody who's grown up on Unix, which I certainly did, um, doesn't realize that a PowerShell pipe Pipes, yeah. objects. That's hurt my brain. That's still hurts my brain. And, and it's like, oh, ah. yeah. That's the hardest thing to get past. The first time I encountered that, I'm like, it pipes objects? Yeah. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just have two words for the difference in this type of characters in Linux and Windows. Fucking Unicode. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> God. That's just an apostrophe single. Ah. Smart ah. quote. Smart quote. Yes. Yeah, I actually figured out on the Mac how to turn fucking smart text off. Yeah. yeah. Well, day. it's because I, I think a lot of the things we were running into, and I still have to research in Python how to do this on a character-by-character -character basis, is the apostrophe. Like, when you do an apostrophe in Linux, it's a single quote, right? But in Unicode, there's separate, there are two separate things. The Unicode character for an apostrophe is not the same. It's no ASCII right. equivalent right. of that. Mm. So when you're taking data between Windows and, yeah, it's, it bites us every... So what that boils down to is the Python application that we have isn't smart enough yet to know. I copied and pasted from a Windows Word document. Right. And that's the Unicode <laughs> representation of right, right. an apostrophe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> smart, smart quotes. Yay. Yeah, I, yeah. To your point, I talk about like having these skills as kind of a secret superpower. And I'll tell you a quick story about my son and my dog, actually. So our dog, Billy, you know, lived a long, happy life and uh, passed away, as dogs do. And it was the first time in my kid's life something like that Sorry happened. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's... And, uh, but that happens, you know, dogs. And it's part of our life. And my, my, my son, also named Eric, wanted to recover. He had a, his screen lock phone on on his iPhone was, was Billy, the picture of Billy. And I was, I was traveling, of course, and I come home and I see him at my wife's computer, kind of upset, it's a Mac. And what he's done, he's trying to recover that, that picture because that's the only high resolution picture he has. He's lost the original, oh. it's a screen lock. And so he's a pretty tech savvy kid, so he backed up the phone to the Mac and yep. he's going through the files, but when he backed up the, the files, all the extensions are stripped out. So it's just like these hash names with no extension. So, so when you go in and browse through, there's no little um, summary picture. There's no yeah. little icon. It's just they're showing yeah. us flat files. So he's manually renaming. There's like 5,000 files, one by one by one, dot .jpeg, like whatever. That. And he's getting upset because it's in there somewhere, and it's going to take him a week. And he's going to do it because he wants that picture. Okay. And I get home, and I see this. I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I sit down, and I show him it's a Mac. So it's basically Unix and yep. user land. Yep. And I write a <clears throat> recursive find. I write a find. Just one big, long bash, you know, find, blah, blah, blah. Kick off the file command. If file says JPEG, rename JPEG. If file says GIF, yep. rename yep. GIF. And it takes me three minutes because it's my background, my first job, yeah. 1991 Unix admin. And in three minutes, it just renames all the files, mm -hmm. adds the extension. And now you can browse in and see the summary mode. There's Billy Click. Right. And so it would have taken him days or a week. It's a great took us example. Five minutes. Great example. And it's, I said yeah. it, it's a secret superpower. It's like an overlay yep. onto reality and allows mm -hmm. you to do things that it, it move at lightning speed and do things you couldn't otherwise mm -hmm. do. You know? and, and I will say that, you know, I've been doing Unix Linux for a decent amount of time. I think I touched my first Linux box when it was Slackware, installing it from Floppies when it first oh, came yeah. out. Yeah, yeah very Red first. Hat, Red Hat 5.2 from Floppies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. I did Slackware before Red Hat. Nice. So, uh, and so I've been doing it a long time and I wouldn't complain, claim to be an expert at any given point, and certainly not when my 19-year-old intern schools me on a weekly basis. <laughs> Seriously. Nice. And now it's just like, you know, I, I, I ask him questions. Like, nice. he said, oh, well, we need to, we should really, uh, you know, compress this file, and we can uh, do it in this fashion. And I even forget which algorithm he's going to be screaming at me now. And he says, oh, if you f throw the dash J with the, the tar command, it will do it with this compression algorithm. But you may also want to specify the number of um, cores that you want to use, because it takes a really long time to compress, in fact. Because, <laughs> like, back in the day, it was like... There was a processor. Right. That was all you had hey, to work yeah, with. Yeah. We had no command line switch yeah. to tell us how many cores. Because yeah. there was only one. Yeah. <laughs> the extraction will be really fast. But uh, if you give it a, a dash nine to do the fastest, com the, the most compression, you might want to add four cores to your virtual machine because it will use all four cores. Decompression will only use one core. Uh, but it will be really fast, even though you compressed it with the most 
compressed, uh, uh, the most awesome. compression. Oh, that, and, that, and, I said, awesome. and I ran it, and I'm like, yeah, I probably should have given this more cores because it took 18 hours. <laughs> 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 it literally took 18 hours to compress like a 4 gig file. Wow. So, you know, I, I, I would never, um, I don't think I could operate in the world without the background that, that, that I have. I grew up, uh, well, first, first Unix I installed was, uh, I think it was Xenix back in the day when they first came out for the PC. But, um, but I grew up on Sun Solaris uh, in my early sysadmin days, and, and yet that kind of experience is just yep. fantastic uh -huh. to too. have. Uh -huh. That's what uh, SunOS, the original BSD True SunOS, uh, 1993, our server got hacked, and uh, I handled the first generation rootkit. I'd already got bought into the internet in 91, and uh, Unix system, and we got hacked in 93, first generation rootkit on the BSD style SunOS 413. And I'm a like, career yep. equals decided. This is it. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. So I was. I was yeah. In, I yeah. Was I mean, admitting. you know, I remember the the very first time I ran into uh, um, uh, the simple uh, flaw where the RM command uh, didn't understand that if you created a file that had dot dot space in it, that it 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 shouldn't traverse up the directory tree. So, you know, you had. <laughs> You had Unix sysadmins writing cron tabs to clean stuff up uh -oh. and do <laughs> RM dash RF whatever, and uh, you had lonely old users out there going, "Ah, oh, I'm going to get them and creating dot dot space dot files." Dot space. And, uh, yeah, That's I came awesome. into work old today. School. Uh, you know, old school. My whole uh, user file system is missing. You yeah. know. <laughs> Whoops! So, Who among us hasn't done that? Good times. Good times. One, one, one to grow I, on. I, I cut my teeth on some of the the, the Unix stuff. You know, you know professionally was uh, was definitely uh, uh, Solaris. Sun OS yeah. uh, yeah. was uh, running uh, managing DNS on a pair of Solaris Spark fives. Nice. And uh, yep. that you know, was, you know when, Windows, I worked, when I worked at the university, that was well before that. I had done Solaris yep. six right in the early two thousands. It was six. Uh, and when I got to university, the other DNS server was Solaris. Yep. Maybe there was some SunOS kicking around when I was at university too. Yep. Uh, like yeah. Older, older stuff. Uh, our, my my first week there, uh, they didn't have a cubicle for me, so I had to share what was entitled an office. Uh, it was used to be the supply closet that they took all the supplies <laughs> out of, and uh, I had to share that with another person. And uh, I Milton was his name. Milton. Pretty Sorry. close. Okay. Uh, I, I, I literally <laughs> had a desk. The size of the countertop bar, but half the length. And on that was a 15-inch monitor for my Windows PC and a 17-inch Sun monitor. Those monitors were awesome. They and were. but the they, problem they, is they, the, they the, shaved yeah. some some years off of our lives. I think with the radiation you got. <laughs> but from the them, the but. monitor was actually deeper than the desk was. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The monitor was like right up to your <laughs> nose, yeah. right? Yeah. It was exactly. so gigantic. <laughs> and what do you think happened to your hair? <laughs> it's still there, sort of. So it's still. Yeah, almost, that's why we're all bald. Almost. Well, Eric somehow. <laughs> Has a radiation shield on or something. I, I'm starting to lose it, but yeah, it's all the radiation from the monitors. Yeah, it's still got most of it. Yeah. Um, so you also want to talk about how to become a sand instructor. Sure. Well, as fun as it is reminiscing about our old school. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, space. absolutely. We could do that probably much longer at a bar. At, that's the hours of the morning. So um, <laughs> how to be a sand instructor is a talk I've been giving for a while. Uh, John Strand gave it first. And then um, he passed the torch to you. He passed the torch. And, and this is a talk I'd love uh, that I'm actually really interested to hear this because I get this from my students a lot. And quite honestly, my uh, my experience is a little bit out of date because things have changed. Mm. Right. Uh, and for me, too. But um, and so it's really it's it's three things, really. It's how to get more inf involved with SANS professionally, meaning where they cut you a check and mentors a good way to start that. So it's mentor stuff. It's really taken on public speaking because public speaking is a huge fear. A lot of people want to do it, but are afraid to do it. There's imposter syndrome. People are afraid, you know, someone in the room knows more than I will and they don't want to get up there. And so all that, and I deal with all that and more, believe me. And then, yeah, how to actually be an instructor if you want to get to the point where, where Larry's gotten, where Joff literally got today. Congratulations again, Joff, because I know what goes into that. And, um, you know, history doesn't repeat, but rhyme, so I have some idea of what you went through. And uh, so it's the three things. How to get more involved with Sands, beginning as mentor, public speaking when you have no background. I had 0.0% .0 background in public speaking. I had none. In fact, I was just talking recently to someone about public speaking. I said, in high school, if my guidance counselor had prepared a list of 100 jobs you could have and asked, asked me to rank them from you know, 1 to 100, the last one I would have picked was public speaking. My guidance counselor, the last one, he would have picked for me was public speaking. <laughs> my parents, the last one, because I had terrible shyness and I had a speech impediment when I was a kid. And all, all those things stacked up against me. And I, I talk to people, and when they're in, that, when they're in that class, that's what they're most intimidated about, is getting in front of a crowd of people. It's an intimidating thing. And what I so that, that's the three parts. So I tell them, I did it. You know, I did it walking the sands with, with nothing. 
and I, it's, ob it's obviously a hard work, preparation, and experience. You know, I've been teaching for Sands for over 10 years. Yeah, picturing everyone you know. in, the, in their underwear only yep. gets you so far. Exactly. And <laughs> so it's, it's really those three things. And so a lot of people come to that talk, and we're happy to talk about tonight. And for me, it led to being, you know, a senior instructor. But it actually can branch out various ways once you mm. get involved in the pipeline. Um, yeah, you know, I think I think the other thing is, you know, being the, being the newly minted guy here, um, a lot of it is getting over the, the, the sort of fear of the unknown. I mean, yeah. you've got to be honest with yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's nobody on this planet that knows everything. Right. Right. Exactly. You have a set of skills and you're there to present those set of skills. It's, it's about being honest with yourself and being honest with, with your audience at the time. And once you sort of get over that, that barrier, then, then things become a lot easier. Well, and, and one of the things that I've realized over the years and become a lot more comfortable with is even when you're presenting to a smaller crowd, there's always at least one person, probably more, that knows yep. more than you about a particular subject. Right. You have to be comfortable with that before you even step onto the stage and right. know that other people are going to know stuff that you don't. Absolutely. And that, that's a hard thing to, to overcome yep. for a lot of people, um, but you have to embrace that. Stephen certainly. Northcutt told me something years ago. He's one of the leaders of SANS, and he said, you know, Eric, people walk into that room liking you. They walk into that room yeah. like they saw that night talk or that derby con or, or, or that stable talk, whatever it is. They saw the title. They saw your name, and they're there. So they're actually on your side. You have right. to pretty much right. actively lose them, and, and, they're, and they're way more forgiving than you think. Like one of the things I recommend if you want to get involved with public speaking, and I'll warn you, it's painful, is record yourself. You know, sit in front oh, of your webcam and, and turn it on and just give your talk to yourself and then play it. And I'm going to warn you, when you play it, it's going to be horrifying because you're going to hear every, every um and every ah and all the things. But you need to – I did that. When I was a mentor, I would do, I'd turn on the webcam, go, and I'd watch. I'm like, oh. And I'm like, okay, round two. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. But what you're hearing, other people Episode don't hear. 519. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 yeah. and you know what? That's really valuable because now that I think about it – I used to listen to every one of our shows when yeah. we released it. Right. We would either edit yeah. it or we would listen. I mean, right. I haven't listened to all 519 right. sure, sure. I, I posts, stopped, but I I quite a few. Yeah, I stopped listening somewhere <laughs> exactly. around the episode 120, 200, somewhere in there. Right. Yeah. Just because there wasn't enough hours in the day. And I, I thought about it. I'm like, why do I need to listen to it again? I was there. Right, right. right. <laughs> That's why I, I said right. the same thing. But I do go back every once in a while and listen to yeah. for oh, just yeah. that reason. Right? Yep. And he's right. You have to actively lose them. So, and, and they're on your side in the ums and ahs. I mean, as long as it's not overwhelming, they generally don't even hear it. Like, one of the things I actually studied, because I didn't know anything about public speaking. So I actually bought books on it and, mm -hmm. I, and I read about it. Well, I think that in and of itself, Eric, is great advice. Right. No, it, it's something you have to study. And it's, one of the things, and um, sort of, you know, when people are talking, when you say um, it, what it actually means is I'm going to pause for a second, but I'm not done yet. So hold on. So the um signifies the other person, I'm not done talking yet. And if you don't say the um, there's, a, there's an actual pause, the other person jumps in. And the problem is that's designed for conversation, and it depends on how you teach. You know, some people teach or speak this way. My name is Eric Conrad, and I'm going to teach. They kind of orate that way. Yes. I find that very unnatural. Now, as Larry Wall once said, there's more than one way to do it, just like your, your whiteboard of 12 ways to do the uh, yep. command. I find that kind of oration, like, I'm speaking to you now on Unix security. I find that very stilted, but I've seen people do it, and it's very successful. My style is more conversational, yes. where just like I'm talking to you guys now, and I have a conversational style where I'm telling stories, a story about my son. I've told that story when we talk about programming in class, because that's the way I teach. I teach in a much more personal manner. The risk of that, though, if you don't do the oration style, you do the conversation style, is you have the ums and the ahs. Yeah. And I still have those things, but once I understood why they were there, and, and as a result of that, the reason they're there, people don't hear it, because it's the same cue, because in, in, in the class, it feels like a conversation, even though it's one mm -hmm. way. So when I'm saying um and ah, we've all been tuned to say, okay, he's just pausing for a second, he's going to keep going. So you'll notice that way more than other people will, you know? Yep. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really, really good comment, um, Eric. And, and, you know, the other thing the other thing that I would add in is um, the, the process while you're becoming a SANS instructor of actually doing the um, the, the yeah, just said, um, right. Yeah, there <laughs> that's you actually, there that's you actually go. the now third time you said it. Because <laughs> <But, laughs> so, so I was actually, listening. Where's my feedback from? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but actually sitting in a room in front of other instructors yeah. with Dave Holzer usually hosts this yep, or yep. has some yep. history and, um, you know, sits down and does very active, uh, feedback without being overly critical. That, sure. that is an incredibly valuable yep. process to go through because you learn so much about yourself and the way you present, 
Um, and, and it's, it's a self-reflective process to improve it. And yeah, it's, you know, it's, it takes work. It takes a lot of work, but uh, worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. I was, uh, was it just last week? It was just last week. I was uh, at the first conference teaching a workshop on effective communication skills and, and, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is stuff that I cover in my workshop, uh, I, I failed ultimately because they gave me 90 minutes and I'm either used to giving this as a talk or as a four hour workshop and they were using the 24 hour clock and I got mixed up and I basically ran out of time and I wasn't done yet. So I'm like, oh, I'm a failure because right, right. I'm teaching a talk on effective communication. <laughs> I couldn't even get through all of my material. But somebody walked up to me afterwards and said, and I had to look up this word in the dictionary, he said, wow, your talk was really prescient in my opinion. <laughs> Um, and for those that don't know what it means, cause I didn't, it, it has something to do with very timely and almost prophetic, you know, it's sure. like spot on. And, uh, but, uh, one of the things I asked, cause I was trying to, I was trying to, uh, in my communication workshop, I want the, I want the people to talk. I don't want to just lecture on how to, you know, communicate. And I was asking them to think about, you know, yeah, you know, we were Thursday, fourth day into the conference, and I asked them to think about some of the best talks that they'd heard during the week, and talk about, uh, you know, what was it that that made it good, you know, and of course content had something to do with, it, but far and away the consistent message was the people were acting like they were just talking, they were engaging the audience right. because they weren't just lecturing, reading from a script. There's actually four speaking styles and, and reading from a script is called manuscript. And, and, you know, everybody consistently says, Oh yeah, that's a horrible. That's, that's, that's the hardest way, or that's the least, uh, enter engaging, entertaining, uh, uh, form of, uh, of lecture or form of, uh, public speaking. But far and away, what's, what's popular is when people are acting like it's just a conversation you know, no matter how canned and memorized it is, at least if it's if they're looking up from a script and engaging the audience, making eye contact, those are all the little things that make it uh, more memorable. And in my opinion, more memorable memorable means uh, the audience, the 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 class, if you will, is going to be more likely to take away you know the stuff that you want them to take away from the course. Right. Yeah, and, yeah, I, yeah the, the, uh, yeah, I would make one more comment. The the other um, the other thing that I had to learn that was that was significantly challenging is is the skill to uh, go through some sort of dialogue, explain something in one certain way, and then sort of watch the audience for their reaction. And and you if you see one or two that get that quizzical look like they didn't quite get yeah. it, then to back up and re-explain the exact same concept in a completely different way. And that is a real trick to do. I mean, it yep. takes some significant conscious effort to sort of get out, of, almost get out of your comfort zone and be in their shoes and be able to do that. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, That's and, great and tip, Joff. Joff mentioned, so we come in to be a SANS instructor. When I came in, we kind of clawed our way in, for the wild, to, in the wild. They, they threw us to the wolves and see if we got out. There was no training that, that, that Joff had. And when people see what I went through to get, get in through SANS, I kind of clawed my way through. But now SANS has built this whole pipeline of Dave Holzer has, has you know, a few hours usually during a big conference. And other instructors will come in. We have the murder boards, which are actually very, very controversial. I know Joff and I'm, I'm sure Larry went through that. But we have all this training now and all this, uh, we're SANS instructors, if you get to a certain point, you know, I mean, we're always on your side, but as you kind of rise to the ranks, just to tell you what the ranks are. For SANS, you walk in as a SANS student. And then if you pass a GX cert, you're now GX certified. And if you get a good enough grade, I think it's 85, you're invited to become a mentor. And most people, I think, probably blow that email off. But I got that email a long time ago, and I'm very glad um, I answered it. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. And, um, and then mentor is where you kind of sit around the table. It's like 18 hours peer-led discussion. Uh, a full SANS class has doubled that, 36 hours, most classes. And the mentor relationship is different than the instruction relationship. Because the mentor relationship is you're sitting around the table. Hey, I've been through this. I'm going to bring you through this. You 
can't teach it in 18 hours if it's a 36 hour course. So you assign homework and they come in the next week. And I did two hours a night for nine weeks. I, I used to work in Boston at a hospital. I was the uh, manager of network and security engineering, as well as unfortunately the HIPAA security officer simultaneously. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I run my own company for nine years now, but back then that's what I did. And um, conference room was empty at night. So they, 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 they comped us a free slot if we gave a conference room. So we had students come in from wherever. And the mentor, it's easier because it's a peer led thing. You know, students come in, your, your keen powers of inference would tell you that some students blew off the homework you assigned and you kind of manage all that as best you can. And if you get through that, there's, there's um, um, community. And do you get ranked as a mentor? You, you get, get uh, scored? You get scored. The feedback forms, just like in SANS, one through right. five, the whole nine yards. And based and SANS is crazy about feedback and, quote, quality, not feedback, quality, as Geoff and Larry can attest to. And then uh, community is the, the same format. It's, you're in the room, you're, you're up in front of the, the room, but it's smaller cities like St. Louis and maybe Pittsburgh that don't get the big show. If you do well there based on the quality, meaning one way they get that, of course, the feedback forms is trial, which Joff just conducted his today, actually, uh, completed his today. And trial is the tryout, meaning they're trying you out for the major leagues, major leagues being certified. Certified, Larry's there, uh, Joff's there, I'm there. And then beyond that, there's principal, senior, and finally fellow. And I've made it up to, to senior. And again, through that process, once you come in, if you're interested, some people do mentor and they want to do that. They have a day job because it's hard if you're teaching 10 weeks a year. I'm not sure how much you teach, uh, Larry or Joff. But if it's, you know... Yeah, at some point you have to find a job that's going to accommodate your teaching. Exactly. Yep. Find either yeah. a, a very understanding employer, which I had initially, like six weeks a year I could kind of push. Beyond that, it was too much. Mm -hmm. And I got to the decision that many of us do. Now, some people have a great employer who are like, yeah, because it brings prestige to the company having, yeah. a, you know, SANS, because we're very visible people, obviously. And, we're, you know, SANS, most InfoSec people on the planet have been reached by the SANS marketing octopus. I, I, I've yeah. you know, envisioned <laughs> these arms reaching around the world and just grabbing InfoSec people. Well, like, that's true. If you're teaching six weeks a year, yeah. even with before you get to certified, right. you're still in front of how many different students exactly. in a year? Exactly. And, and the networking... Hundreds, I mean, hundreds at yeah. least. Maybe over a thousand. Yeah, right? exactly. And the networking is insane. You know, and, and if you've been around a while... I mean, I was 20... In my 20s, I didn't see this. But networking is the key mm. to success in this career. The, the old what you know versus how you know. It's actually both. You need to really, really do both. And if all you do is the what you know... Now, maybe you get so awesome at some point, you become like HD Moore and you transcend all this. You just kind of become so awesome and it doesn't matter anymore. He networks plenty, too. For me, what you know and who you know, building that human network. As you progress more in this career, it's easy to get dead-ended because you're making too much money for this job. My, my last company I talked about, you know, I loved it there, but I was stuck. There, there was no place further for me to go as a tactical person. I was told to get the promotion to director. I had to put on a suit, stop touching technology entirely, yeah. you know, basically fill a TPS reports all day long. And who wants to do that? Well, Oof. someone does, but not me, right? I don't want to do that. And so if you want to stay purely technical, now some companies like Google and IBM, they have these technical excellence and yeah. fellow tracks, but most companies don't have Cisco that. Cisco, too. Yeah, Cisco, too, but most my company did. Distinguished I, engineer. They big call it distinguished, Cisco. exactly. Yeah. Fellow, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and so as you get further in, if you want to stay, as I did, technical, like the most management I've ever wanted to do was head up a team. Like technical team, I love that stuff. Give me a team, some young kids, mix. I'm, I'm all about that. But put on a suit and reports, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. That's, you know, someone else does. I'm not good at that. It's mm. not, what I, not what my passion is. And so... One of the things about SANS is, so, so I teach maybe 12, 13 weeks a year. I've been doing it for over 10 years. And you figure out the hours involved with that and the thousands of people mm -hmm. I've met by that and the connections you start making. So it, there's a lot of ways to network, obviously. But SANS, for me, offers an avenue that I probably wouldn't have found on my own. I'm personally yeah. very introverted. You know, I, I tell people all the time, if I'm at a cocktail party, party with doctors and lawyers, I'm useless. I just shut down. I get quiet. And one of the hilarious things, if you're like, I'm a big dude. If you're a big dude at a cocktail party and you're standing in the corner not saying anything, you become like threatening and ominous. Like, who's that big dude not saying anything? You know, and so <laughs> I'm just trying to hang out and just be chill. You know? <laughs> and so doctors, lawyers, I'm useless. I'm just useless. But among nerds, these my friends, we get excited about Unix command line stuff and Sparks and whatever. I'm the version of me my friends see. So in class, and that's the other thing a lot of people coming into SANS on instructor side, a lot of geeks are introverts. And they see someone yeah. like John Stream practically bouncing off the walls. And we talk about kind of the emotive scale of SANS instructors, where John Strand's, if you draw a bell curve of how emotive you are, how much you push yourself out there. John Strand's over here on, on, the, on the right side of that bell curve. I'm somewhere towards that, not on the John level, but I'm actually pretty emotive. And then you got other people like, like James Tarala, who's an awesome instructor. I, I saw him teach 617 years ago, the wireless class. And he was just 
total ninja knowing his stuff, but not like John Strand. And there's all kinds of different ways to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And but he just commanded the room, knew his stuff, total command presence. And owning that room, command presence is really key, you know, because one of the things people worry about is what if someone starts talking, and what if someone challenges my authority? They know something I don't know. I say something wrong. They'll they'll call me out on it. I remember fearing all these things. Mm -hmm. And when I yep. first started, I had more of that happening, and I realized I wasn't owning the room enough. I wasn't yeah. just pushing myself, whether you're motive or not. And, and so I wasn't pushing myself out there. And the more command presence you have, the less that will happen, because they're really just testing you usually to see who's in charge. Some, some A-type personalities need to know who the boss is. And once you so, show them who the boss is, they usually are perfectly fine. And so being, be, being having that command presence and being out there, um, you know. Yeah. And knowing what to say in response. Knowing to what to say in response. Because there's a number of different responses, <laughs> right? Because exactly. sometimes you have to like go down the technical route, right. maybe. Sometimes you have yep. to go like the social route. But yep. like sometimes... I feel like, and I don't know if this is a tactic or not, but I use it sometimes. Sure, sure. You just have to make a joke. Yeah. About, like, without yeah. insulting them. Right. But just turn it into a joke. Yep. And then I think they realize, like, you have a sense of humor and you're a real person. And right. they're like, all right, I'm just going to kick back and, and listen for the most part. Now. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But just back to my point. And so the, the introverts see us doing that. And they think, wow, I'm introverted. I couldn't possibly be that out there. And again, there's a range of, of emotions or emotive teaching styles. <laughs> But, but for the introverts who come to my How to Be a Sands Instructor talk, I tell them that I, I am an introvert myself, but I, I ask them, how do you act among your friends? Like your best friends, when there's no strangers in the room, it's just you and your, your buddies, your pals, how do you act? Because you're, if, if you're a nerd, you're among friends. And that, for me, was what really unlocked it. Yeah. I, I act my true self. I'm acting much more naturally now than I was at the party we're at on, on where I live. It was just kind of stiffy, stuffy, and I was just hiding in the corner. Do do doctors and lawyers, right? <laughs> Doctors and lawyers. I struggle with that, too, right? Because like, you, you spend all day like learning Docker and containers. Right. And and you get into that environment and like that's what I want to talk about. And I'm like, no, nobody here yeah. knows, knows what a container is. I, like, you I know, I, I just, I, I'm so you, excited. Put your leftovers in, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I am just so excited to hear Eric say that because um, <laughs> I, I'm probably uh, not quite as uh, introverted as it sounds like uh, Eric is, but that is the key. When you go in there and you just say, "Hey, I'm amongst friends." Yeah. And it becomes a conversation amongst friends. You still got to take control of the room. Of you still got to be that guy who owns that room. But once it's a conversation amongst friends and you start that rapport going, it's usually that first day in a SANS class. Yeah, once yeah. you get over that first day and you learn the personalities, it's all golden from there, provided you've got, you know, you've got everybody in the right categories <laughs> as you're teaching that day. Excellent. Uh, okay, with that, you've answered the five questions before. I have not. Okay. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, giant InfoSec nerd. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Sarcasm. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Do androids dream of electric sheep? In the popular <laughs> game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? First every time. Care to demonstrate? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for someone to ask. It was embarrassing there for a minute. The room got Choose quiet. two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional or otherwise. Um, Grace Hopper. Um, I know she had a lot of kids apparently. Oh, that's fantastic. And uh, Andre the Giant. There you go. Wow. Nice. That would wow. make an interesting kid. Yeah. You've, you've thought about these, you, you you've thought about these kids questions kids. before, haven't you? Uh, some of them, not all. But, but, but Grace Hopper was automatic. Yeah. And um, Andre the Giant, I just I read about his life. Did, and you, did you bring your nanosecond <laughs> with you by chance? <laughs> I, did, I did not bring the nanosecond. <laughs> uh, there's a famous picture of Andre the Giant holding a beer, and the beer looks like a, like, like a, 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 a nip, like a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. it's the size of a thimble. And it just, looks like a shot glass. I, if you read about his life, it's interesting, because it, most people who are like seven and a half feet tall and weigh 500 pounds, they kind of mold their lives around them. Like they, they buy a car that's twice as big, they build a bed. He was flying like coach to Japan, and he was going to Japanese. <laughs> he was traveling like we do, but he was just, it's, it's an interesting kind of poignant, sad life. So, Andre the Giant, read about that. Excellent. Eric, thank you very much. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come Anytime. back with our technical segment for this evening. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 